what I'm going to do today is I'm not really going to dwell on work specifically that I made in the 1980s, though so I might refer back to them at certain points during this talk. But really, I'm going to uh, just um, talk about the evolution of the ideas that I've had towards work in the last 15 years or so and talk about what I'm kind of planning and what I'm plotting for the future. So really, things started for me in 85, when I, as Mark mentioned, Ron and I, I were invited to uh, make the exhibition of constructed narratives. I, and we toured that to all kinds of places, so we ended up going to all kinds of unlikely venues. But every night was like a Ferrari, Ferrari Roche aircraft. And um, <coughs> for me, that was an establishment of my career in London, and I was able to really just make work. And what I was really interested in was um, kind of my heroes in photography. It, it always seemed to me when at some point I'd taken up painting, it, usually towards the end of their career, I'd kind of abandoned photography and taken up painting. And whenever I saw them doing that, I was always like, disappointed. I was always thinking, well, is photography not enough? So for me, I always thought, somehow, if photography can encompass everything, of all your activities, no matter what they are, come back to photography. And in that sense, that kind of validates photography as a process, and it makes it, for me, it makes it relevant to my life. So anyway, in the mid-80s, a friend of mine, a writer called David Patain, came to visit me in my studio in London, uh, and he chucked a copy of the London Review of Books and the Table, and he said, you should make sure of this. And it was a view of uh, a new edition by Howard Gaskell of James McPherson's uh, Ossian. So I had a look at that, of course, well, I wasn't specifically interested in <coughs> in terms of uh, the relative merits of the writing, but what I was interested in was the notions of truth, uh, fact, fiction, uh, and the idea of uh, presenting a culture uh, in a different kind of way. And at that point, photography was beginning to change, the digital engine was coming along, I was very interested in this a changeover, and I was thinking at some point in the future we will no longer have the same act, uh, the same relationship to photography. It will be no longer act. for 10 years, for longer, 15 years. I was making pictures and making it all happen in front of the camera, and uh, that was the way he did it because uh, there were, of course, uh, collage photography artists around. But the college work was kind of obviously an artifice. But when it came with digital imaging, it seemed to me that the, the artifice was going to be seamless uh, as the technology progressed. So I was thinking, well, how can I make that relate to a body of work? Which is really the basis of the idea of the Ossian series, where I made these are the nine of my large images. Uh, I'll show them together there and say a few years back. But really the idea of that body of work, I'm not really going to talk about the pictures specifically or comment on them until I don't have time for that. But my idea with that body of work was to present them on canvas, stretched, varnished, quite sloppily, the bits of varnish dripping off them, present them as paintings, because this was the first time I actually could do that. And I was really interested in because my work has this relationship to painting, sculpture. I was really interested to see what would happen if I presented them as a kind of forgery. Uh, images dwelling on the of forgery. I've never had a question like that. <laughs> so, I was looking at various um, fragments, this pieces. <laughs> <laughs> Children and animals, I'm not all I was looking at various um, fragments, or bits of objects that I had in my studio. I was looking at ideas of, of artificial like, history, of ersatz history, ersatz culture, and real culture. So, for instance, I made a series of images looking at this fragment, this image of a, a Maori chief who I was kind of thinking as a foil for an idea of a Pict 
fetish warrior. And then see what would happen if you transform them into uh, an image of, uh, it's one of these Dawson's heads of uh, a jock. So an idea of a Pictish culture and then a kind of Harry Waters culture. So that was a series of seven images, large scale. Uh, that was the basic idea, all printed on canvas. And then slowly removed, that became more and more interesting idea of series. And then I commissioned a digital forgery as a portrait of James McPherson. So the idea of the accused forgery being produced as a portrait, in my style, but as a forgery. Strangely, over the years, as we, um, the ability to manipulate photography became more and more easy, more and more accessible, I suppose. Because initially, the first few projects I was involved in, the machinery, uh, the technology was so expensive, there was only uh, professional photo labs who had that kind of stuff and that was how you accessed it. But now anybody can get a copy of the job and put together a collage. So um, as it's become easier and easier, I've actually ended up doing uh, less and less of it. And I've really just gone back to working with a tiny camera in a studio, a few lights and whatever bits of junk the neighbours are throwing out, a few things that they might be in the queue. And that's kind of how I I uh, enjoy working. These works are um, the stills from a uh, theatre design I did for the Lyceum not long after I did the um, Ossian exhibition. So the Ossian exhibition was in the Portugal in Edinburgh 2001, but it brought from an idea in the mid 80s, uh, and that kind of toured in all kinds of places over the years. And then I was asked uh, to do a theatre design. And I based the design for the theatre on the idea of a large bellows camera. The character in the play by uh, Peter Armour was a photographer. So I kind of turned the I see the theatre with a giant bellows camera, an odd way. But I've always kind of gone back to just working with a tiny camera in the studio. Various kind of series of work, a series called Ornithology, a series called Two Ways of Life. Siren. And this goes back to 1987. This is the earliest work I'm going to show you, I think. This is called Narcissus. Which ended up rather oddly in the uh, uh, Ongre Museum in Montepon, uh, hanging up next to the original. Rather oddly, this was an exhibition organised by the Louvre, and they tried to borrow the picture, which was owned by the Scottish National. Gallery Modern Art put next to that painting. And he said no. So that's relevant to the way that stuff. So the work became in some ways more complex and it took longer and longer. Uh, I'm quite used to spending up to six months in one picture. Um, the world's slowest photographer. But really I was just trying to get into the painting and trying more and more to um, to see how far I could go with the idea of painting but towards photography, which a lot of people still consider to be you know, madness. Maybe they're right, of course. And this is a studio. Gradually over the years, I began to think, well, I suppose as the painting style evolved, I began to think, what would happen? How do you sort of go beyond this glossy surface of the sea become print? And then I'd gone into working digitally in terms of printing, printing on canvas. And then I began to think, well, how can you go kind of beyond all those and somehow present an image so seamless that it takes it back to the sculptural and painting the roots whilst remaining embedded within photography? So what I kind of thought was I'll do um, stereo photography. And I thought, well, stereo photography has my mechanoglyphs, uh, I'll make uh, stereo uh, double pictures, and I'll make an exhibition about that. And then I thought, of course, what, what is stereo, what's the history of stereo photography? And the more I looked at that, the more I thought it was an interesting kind of uh, abandoned history to do with stereography. 
uh, in, within the history of photography. Uh, and I came across Sir David Brewster, uh, the Scottish scientist, uh, natural philosopher, inventor of the kaleidoscope, uh, inventor of the lenticular stereoscope. And then in conjunction with um, a, a visual psychologist at the University of Dundee, who's also a, a very knowledgeable historian about stereo history, he introduced me to the ideas of um, uh, to the mirror stereoscope by Charles Wheatstone, uh, and then I can start reading about the, kind of the uh, dispute that they had. And then I became very interested in the science and art of photography, all sort of produced within this exhibition called Natural Magic. And really, I also ended up taking it back to, as in that image, looking at the history of perspective, looking at perspective boxes, that kind of thing, and making images like this. This is one of the six months. And when you see this in stereo, what you actually do is you see this as a mirror, and when you see in that mirror, this hand, which is reaching out, is painted behind this canvas, which is probably about two so long because I was painting in reverse, but also because I kind of did my head in the idea that you actually can see around the corners <laughs> the stereo at all. But I'm not going to show you any stereo today. I often do in hand at me red and green glasses and do the whole thing in So that was the kind of um, the idea of that work. I kind of explored various things as a, a phenomenon called binocular rivalry. If you look in the left hand image in this uh, van pass image, there is a candle in the right hand image is not there. When you combine that stereoscopically, there are three different ways to stereoscopically combine that. But when you combine that, when you look at it, the candle appears and then it disappears and then it reappears. Over a space of about 30 seconds, it varies from person to person. But the idea of that, again, fascinated me because you would think you would look at that, combine it stereoscopically, that you would get a ghost of the candle. But you don't. Your brain presents you with both possibilities. So I'm very interested in that idea. So there is a mirror stereoscope and the light stereoscope. And in the exhibition I presented the works as portraits, a lot of them, this is a portrait of Charles Wheatstone, printed on canvas, <coughs> presented on easels, uh, with the mirrors, or the mirror stereoscopes, presented on a sculptor's modeling stand. And the viewer would come up, stick the nose to the two mirrors, and see the image. Stereoscope. Mirror stereoscopes are the best way to see images uh, in 3D. Particularly, as I use mirrors, sort of front surface mirrors, so there's no ghost there. Incredibly clear three dimensional image. But of course, what I was trying to do with the show, I thought at first, was to bring people back to the original place of where the work was made, the idea of work in a studio, three dimensionally painted. But actually what it did is it took people somewhere else. Because if you look at a 3D photograph, a still 3D photograph, you don't see the world, you don't see a, a, a three-dimensional representation of the world as you view it. Because as you construct the world, it's the 3D around you, your eyes are in constant movement. And that is how we negotiate the world. But a still photograph in 3D, it's really kind of folded out in a weird kind of way. So I realised, in fact, that what I was doing with this work was taking people to a different kind of way. So that was kind of interesting. Since then, I've gone back to making a few portraits. I'm going to do a show at the Burns Museum next year. I've done, I did a photograph of this guy who I knew from my childhood. He was a great man for reciting uh, Burns' poetry. Particularly after a few pints. James McMillan, portrait for the Scottish National Portrait Gallery. This is Byron. A recent project, uh, I hope it's a bit more modern, Burns. A recent project was a book uh, called In Memoriam for uh, Dundee, uh, 
of the Dundee University Press, we made a book and it was about people who donate their bodies to medical science every year in Scotland. For each university, about 20 or 30 people donate their bodies to medical science. And uh, Dundee University, I presume the other universities do as well, Dundee University every year have a service with the uh, anatomy students. Uh, they have a, a service with one of the cadavers, one of the bodies, and the families all come along. And the book was really about the idea of um, people's life stories, it was about people donating their bodies. So I kind of thought for a while that this project was really, I thought it was about anatomy, but it turned out for me really to be about uh, passing away and shapes and forms uh, as people disappear from the world, what we leave behind. So I kind of ended up with this and the fact that that was the last one. So really that's probably the most minimal I'll ever get. But I quite like the idea of a, an image that goes into blackness with just the slightest in of all six months worth of effort and pain hidden away behind. The idea of beyond death of being here but not being here. And within it for the book, I, I worked into after I finished the picture, I worked in lots of snapshots. These are all the people who donated their bodies to uh, Dundee University Anatomy Department. So when we launched the book, we did a talk with um, Professor Sue Black from the co fame Cold Cases fame, and uh, Kirsty Gunn, who had organised the written element. And it was really a very moving occasion because all the families were there. Uh, the people who were going to donate their bodies and families of people that had donated their bodies. One guy phoned up the anatomy department to discuss arrangements for donating his body. And as he said, at the age of 70, to be wanted for your body is <laughs> <laughs> So, these were images made specifically for the group. And the book, I think, is distributed through lots of uh, doctor surgeries. So if you go there for like a bad cold, and we get encouraged to uh, donate the body to medical science. There's no point in missing an opportunity. <laughs> so, over the years, I've always been very interested in um, Scottish culture, born in Prince Charlie and Biscuitin. And that's featured in many exhibitions that I've done. Um, there's a kind of um, an odd uh, sense in the way that, as an artist, you're discouraged from making work. <coughs> very particular, but I've always believed in within the local, within the particular, there is a universal. So I've always been very um, pro uh, making work about your own culture, your own history, your own people. So <coughs> I'm increasingly interested in the Jacobites. My next body of work will be about Jacobites. I became intrigued by uh, secret symbolism within Jacobite art. So it's for in the print papers, I made a series of images of prints of um, Bonnie Prince Charlie as a young man, as an old man, based on this uh, uh, animal forces of the uh, Mary Queen of Scots, which is in the um, portrait gallery, and there's my version. And there it is, showing that Traquair house down in the borders, in Indonesia. I make plates, put pictures on the ceramics. Uh, that's something I've become obsessed with recently. So there's Robert Burns on this and uh, Cobalt Blue Ceramic Play. What it will be when we finally get it right. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.